thanks for the invitation to come here. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about diffusion in area preserving maps. And uh, uh, this is a topic we have already dealt with uh, many, many years, during many years. Uh, so I will try to address three different uh, procedures to investigate these uh, diffusions. One is uh, what we call this phenomenological. We do simulations and measure uh, the uh, diffusion regimes of growth and saturation and so on. And then we introduce a transformation uh, that uh, modifies the equations, the difference equations into a differential equation. And then we can solve it uh, analytically and uh, the relevant scaling exponents which came from the phenomenological theory appears analytically. And then finally, the last approach is was a paper published this year. We solve analytically the diffusion equation and the three relevant scaling uh, exponents appear. So uh, there is here a mapping of the South America, part of South America. We see here Rio, Rio Grande do Norte, where we are now. There is here a boundary of the state of Sao Paulo, this state where uh, our university is. Uh, the boundary is here, so we, we see he's, uh, here Sao Paulo, the capital, then Campinas, and then Rio Claro, about 120 kilometers far north northwest. So uh, uh, UNESP is one of the campus in, in Rio Claro. Our university is spread over the state of Sao Paulo in 24 cities. So uh, uh, Rio Claro has two institutes in physics department is there. So the goals of my talk is to discuss some statistical properties for chaotic diffusion in two-dimensional maps and then finally give some arguments. This uh, scaling formalism uh, used to investigate chaotic orbits in two-dimensional mappings can be extended to investigate diffusion in time-dependent billiards. So, uh, who have the opportunity to attend on Felix's talk there was a very nice definition on ergodicity in his talk. Then I will just uh, rephrase some of these concepts. So assume we have a dynamic described by a mapping T for this case. For a given mapping T, the average over the time for an, for an observable f of x is defined at this form. So we have an f star of x which is as, uh, an average over the time. So it's limit when capital N goes to infinity, 1 over N. There is a summation when N goes to 0 to N plus 1, and successive applications of the map to the variable X. And then it can be showed two uh, properties. First, F star of X exists. And second, F star is an invariant function. So this is a part of the definition of the, the erg ergodicity, which deals with the average over the time. The second thing is that the average over the phase space, many times also uh, called as ensemble average, is defined as an overline f, is integration over mi, f of x the mi, where this mi is an invariant measure, and the mi is defined as a P of x, the x, and P is an invariant distribution. Then, a dynamical system is to be ergodic if f star of x equals to overline f. Felix already discussed that in mixed Hamiltonian systems, mixed systems, we don't see uh, ergodicity. And then, I will uh, describe some, dis some diffusion in mixed phase space particularly on the chaotic orbits far away from the uh, periodic regions from the KM islands. Near the KM islands, we see dynamical trapping. This dynamical trapping is also called stickiness. And this stickiness uh, generally transforms the diffusion into anomalous diffusion. And this uh, is, is still an open problem that many scientists are still discussing nowadays. So, yes. Well, uh, depends on the type of system you are considering. In in our case, we are uh, using area-preserving maps. 
So the variables are uh, uh, chosen in the sense that the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is equal to 1. And then, uh, generally, is the product of the differential elements, as for example, di or d phi, as for example, in this case. Liouville yes, Liouville measure. Okay, so uh, then let us enter the topic. I will consider a most generic Hamiltonian system of this type. So it is uh, constructed, composed in of two parts. One is this age naught, which is an integrable part, depends only on two dynamical variables. And then there is a perturbation, epsilon age one. And then this age one is dependent on four on the fourth dynamical variables. So if epsilon equals to zero, we have an integrable part of the Hamiltonian. And if epsilon is different from zero, we have a, a non-integrable Hamiltonian. And then we want to investigate the diffusion, of the chaotic diffusion, near this transition from integrability to non-integrability, right? So generally, it's near epsilon equals to zero. So what happens if epsilon equals to zero? If epsilon equals to zero, the uh, two dynamical variables theta1 and theta2 are cyclic. I1 and I2 are constant. And theta1 and theta2, of course, are functions which depends on I1 and I2. This is the trivial case discussed in many test books. And when epsilon is different from zero, there is a technique to transform this uh, Hamiltonian into a generic mapping of this form. So what is uh, the procedure? First, the Hamiltonian is independent of time, so it's autonomous. And this is a constant. So we, we may take advance of this constant and eliminate one of these four dynamical variables, for example, I2. So if we eliminate this dynamical variable R2, we end up with a flow of three dynamical variables, I1, theta1, and theta2. If we intercept this three-dimensional flow by a plane with a theta2 constant, we end up into a surface of session which the points crossing such session are describing by a mapping of this form. There are three functions which we have liberty to choose. Liberty in some sense, because there must exist a relation between this function h and p, such that the mapping should preserve the area, because it came from a Hamiltonian. So, H and P should obey this equation here. It must be equals zero, this derivative of P with respect to theta, and derivative of H with respect to I n plus one should be zero. It uh, guarantees the area preservation of the mapping. So, in this talk, I will choose uh, specific values or specific expressions for the function H, P, and two different expressions for K. The first one I want to discuss is, uh, well, uh, why choose age as a sign? Felix told us about the standard mapping. And Fishman also uh, gives some illustration of this mapping. So this nonlinear function was present there. And then I want to connect our results in somehow with a very specific transition. The uh, Shirikov mapping exhibits. So this will be uh, clear a little bit later, which is a transition from global to local chaotic dynamics. So I'll fix this as a, a sine function. To eliminate this dependence on epsilon, on the, the variable theta n plus one, I will set p equals to zero. And then I will choose uh, different expressions for k. One, which is uh, one over i n plus one to a parameter gamma, gamma gamma is larger than one, non-negative, uh, and this will lead to diffusion for low action and regularity for uh, large action on the phase space. A typical mapping that describes the dynamic is of this type. So we may see here 
the parameter epsilon controlling the uh, non intensity of the nonlinearity, therefore controlling a transition from integrability to non integrability. Almost yes, but this is a family because there is a parameter here. Yes. And then uh, when the capital I is small, we see here that is a ratio. This ratio becomes very large. Then we sum up with this theta and takes the modulo 2 pi. As soon as we, we take the modulus 2 pi, theta n plus 1 becomes uncorrelated to theta n. And because this dynamical variable theta is argument of this periodic function sign, we have then an equation that describes a type of random walk dynamics. The phase space looks like this one. So for a uh, very small uh, action near zero, we see this very beautiful cloud of points, which is called chaotic C. Chaotic because if we measure the Lyapunov exponent, it is positive according to uh, the most acceptable definition of chaos in, in current uh, uh, literature. We see here a barrier which is uh, also called invariant tori, many times also called as invariant spanning curve. It's spanning because it spans the phase space. A particle moving inside of this chaotic uh, uh, sea cannot cross the invariant spanning curve. Then uh, this uh, phase space is uh, composed by regularity up there in chaotic seas here. Uh, there are two different control parameters, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. We see here similarities, but uh, with uh, different amplitudes of this dynamic variable. The second choice, so I will discuss this uh, chaotic diffusion for such chaotic C. For the second choice, we end up exactly to the Shirikov uh, mapping. That is a control parameter. Israelev uh, used uh, capital K instead of my epsilon, which doesn't matter, right? But there is a transition here. Uh, Shirikov Taylor uh, mapping admits two very nice transitions. One is a transition from integrability to non integrability when this epsilon equals to zero. If epsilon equals to zero, we have an integrable system. If epsilon is different from zero, we have a non integrable one. Chaos emerge, we have periodic regions, we have periodic islands, we have uh, invariant tori. And the second transition appears when this epsilon here uh, assumes values larger than 0 0.9716 and so on. So we have a transition from locally to globally chaotic dynamics. And the phase space, the phase space looks like this. Uh, yeah, the phase space looks like this. Well, this should be epsilon. And then for uh, epsilon 0 0.5, we see mostly regularity on the phase space. As soon we uh, increase the parameter, chaos appear in the phase space, but we still see periodic regions. 0 0.97 is just before the destruction of these uh, invariant spanning curves. And for a larger K, which is my epsilon in this presentation, we see here unlimited diffusion for this dynamical variable i. Of course, this unlimited diffusion is uh, observable only for specific conditions, initial conditions. If we choose an initial condition inside of a periodic island, it never diffuses outside, right? And then, uh, I will start discussing some diffusion for this choice of capital K, right? A transition happens in 0 0.916 and so on. But this transition is very well understood on the literature. So what we can do with this uh, diffusion? We want to uh, investigate what should we introduce to the mapping 
that in order to, uh, instead of observe unlimited diffusion for the dynamical variable i, what should we introduce to suppress such uh, diffusion? So we introduce what we call this dissipation. So this parameter uh, gamma here belongs to 0 and 1. And it can be understood as a type of restitution coefficient, right? Then at each interaction of the mapping, we have a loss of energy of, uh, uh, from, the, from the dynamics in the, in the sense that the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is equal to 1 minus gamma. So area preservation is observed only when gamma equals to 0. Any different value of gamma, gamma belongs to 0 and 1, produces determinant smaller than 1. What this means in terms of uh, topological. So if the determinant is smaller than 1, the Liouville theorem does not apply anymore. So we have not preservation of area in the phase space. It means that we shrink area in the phase space then attractors exist in the phase space. Given that these attractors are far away from the infinity, this is enough condition to guarantee suppression of this unlimited diffusion. So we see here a plot of uh, the i against theta. You see the, the, the amplitude of the parameter very far away from this uh, transition from limited to unlimited energy growth, the chaoticity. And we, when we choose a very small dissipation, by this plot, 10 to the minus 2. So by these choices, we see that the amplitude of this chaotic attractor, I'm not plotting the Lyapunov exponent, but we have measured the Lyapunov exponent, and is positive, is uh, limited about 1,005, less than 2,000, either positive or negative. A quick look also allow us to conclude that the density near zero is higher as compared to uh, far away from zero. We have uh, evidences that this distribution is, is Gaussian. So what we want to look at uh, this uh, chaotic attractor, we want to look at this observable here i root mean square. What is this? i root mean square is constructed from two different averages. One average is uh, taken over the time. So we square the average, sum along the orbit, and then we sum over an ensemble of different initial conditions. And f to obtain this plot here, we have chosen a very small initial action, i. i not was very close to zero. Why this choice? This choice was made to give the ensemble of particles the opportunity to have a maximum diffusion as possible. So uh, we see then different parameters. We have two different values of epsilon, 10 to the 2, and 10 to the 3, which are these two curves. And, th and three uh, different choices for the dissipation. The larger dissipation is 10 to the minus 2, which uh, leads to a very uh, the, the lower saturation as possible. What we can uh, observe from these plots? It's a log log plot. For a small n, which is our dynamic variable, the curves of i root mean square grow to start with n, and this regime of grow is marked by a power law. If we measure this slope here, this slope is about 0 0.5, therefore we are observing normal diffusion. And then each one of these curves passes from a regime of growth to a regime of saturation. And the this transition from growth to the saturation is marked by a crossover in x 
And this crossover in X depends on the choices of the parameters. So our first description was then uh, choosing what we called as scaling hypothesis. So this is a smaller version of the plot. And the first choice from this plot here is that for a small n, I mean, before the crossover, I root mean square grows according to a power law on n to a, an exponent beta. And this exponent beta, we measure it, it is about 0 0.5 half. For a larger value of n, we are just looking at these saturation curves here. And the saturation curves depend on on the choices of the counter parameters. So there are a dependence on epsilon to a power alpha 1 and gamma to uh, power alpha 2. This is a second uh, scaling hypothesis. And finally, the crossover, which marks the transition from the regime of growth to the saturation, depends also on the counter parameters. I will not show here, but Basically, we can describe these three scaling hypotheses using a homogeneous generalized function, very similar to the one used in statistical mechanics. And we prove that there are two scaling laws. These scaling laws relate a set of these five exponents, which we call as critical exponents, they relate uh, the exponents among them. So the exponent z1 is alpha 1 over beta minus 2. And this uh, exponent z2 is alpha 2 over uh, beta. How can we have uh, a glance at these exponents? So numerically, we can measure these saturations here. So we can measure the I, s I root mean square for large n as function of the counter parameter, and we can measure also the crossover. So specific plots, I root mean square at very large n against epsilon gives an exponent 1. Saturation against gamma gives an exponent very close to minus a half. Exponent z1 should not depend on epsilon, our result is very close to zero, and the crossover against gamma gives an exponent minus one. So what should we do, uh, what should we do then with this set of five critical exponents? Uh, we, may, we may test the scaling laws, but the beautiful result is that the knowledge of the five critical exponents can be used to transform the curves of I root mean square uh, onto uh, specific transformations leading to a single and universal plot. So what this result means? It means that the chaotic, C, the chaotic attractor measured on the uh, plot I against uh, theta is scaling invariant with respect to the choices of the counter parameter. So this uh, was uh, made as a motivation to argue on this phenomenological result. But these results I have already shown were published uh, in the, the past few years, but the first observation of this approach was made on the Fermulan model first publication using this scaling formalism, uh, proposing hypotheses, homogeneous function, etc., was observed in 2004. So what is this model? So the model was uh, proposed by Enrico Fermi, 1949, as an attempt to describe the height energy of the cosmic particles observed in the Earth. So Fermi assumed that the particles uh, 
at that time known as uh, charged, could be accelerated by electric or magnetic fields present on the cosmos, which, by the way, were not static. They were time-dependent. So, uh, in the laboratory, this idea of Fermi was modeled by a very simple model. That is one moving wall, a classical particle of mass m, and a fixed wall. This fixed wall was used to rebound back the particle for a next collision. And uh, uh, the dynamics of the particle was described by a two-dimensional map, area preserving one, which has a control parameter very similar to what we have seen a few minutes before. If epsilon equals to zero, the velocity of the particle is constant, then uh, the moving wall was fixed. There is no moving wall at all. This term here, 2 over Vn, gives the elapse of time a particle uh, moves between the impacts, and the determinant of the Jacobian matrix is equal to 1. So, this. This is so-called phase is the interval of time. The, fi the moving wall, the moving wall. Yeah, the moving wall. So the, the phase space, uh, the surface of session is introduced in the moving wall. But this, this model here is uh, what we called a static wall approximation. Many years ago, it was called a simplified version. So it assumes that both walls are fixed by simplicity. Why simplicity? Because they can calculate the, the interval of time analytically. Yeah, no, we take only on the moving wall, yes. Well, anyway, then uh, if we look at the average velocity against n, it has similar properties of the plot I showed on the i root mini square. So we see here different curves for different parameters, and all curves overlap each other on a single plot uh, when we rescale properly the axis. And here we have made a more general result uh, that we, we choose a different initial velocity as contrary to what I have shown in the uh, dissipative standard map. And a publication of these results were made in Physical Review Letters 2004 in collaboration with Jefferson Silva in Belo Horizonte and Peter McClintock in Lancaster. So, based on this uh, motivation, I will then move to the second choice of the function k, which is a family of this uh, fermi Euler model, right? We see here... Uh, the term which produces diffusion for a small action, it, at the same time, it leads to regularity as soon as uh, the diffusion grows because the action grows. So we see here uh, this chaotic region for a small values of the action. As soon as the particle diffuses, the action rises, either, either in the positive or negative, values and eventually it reaches a invariant spanning curve which is a barrier do not letting particles to cross then our uh, observable is very similar to what we want we have made in the previous uh, approach we want to look at the behavior of r root mean square it's an average over the orbit and an average over the over an ensemble average so the plot is uh, what we, we are seeing here. All curves grow to start with, and then eventually they saturate. But here we see different, uh, that the curves, they, they grow parallel to each other, but starting from different values. So three different control parameters, but this is generic. We may choose any other parameter. But when we do this ad hoc transformation, n, is replaced by n epsilon squared. All of the curves 
starts to grow with and together. And this transformation allows us to propose the three scaling hypothesis, encompass this uh, homogeneous function, and uh, uh, end up with this uh, scaling law. So here we have only uh, three critical exponents. Beta is called acceleration exponent. Alpha is uh, sometimes uh, called as saturation exponent. And this uh, Z is imported from the statistical mechanics, called as dynamical exponent. Specific plots for gamma 1, gamma 2 gives alpha 0 0.5, Z minus 1. For gamma 2, uh, alpha is about one-third. I will prove that this is one-third a little bit later. And this exponent Z here is from the order of minus 1.5. 0.3, but analytically it is minus four thirds. We can prove this analytically. And when we transform the axis properly, all the curves overlap each other onto a single and universal plot. What does it mean? It does mean that when we are looking at the chaotic sea, at the regime of chaos far away from the islands, the diffusion is normal. We can see a um, uh, regime of growth 0 0.5. And this uh, chaotic C far away from the thickness is invariant with respect to the control parameter. It does not matter which parameter you choose. We'll see exactly the same behavior. Of course, for small control parameters near the transition from integrability, non-integrability, where this approximation is valid. Okay, so the result I have shown here was made by using a uh, phenomenological approach, and then we moved to what we called a semi-analytical approach. This is only a term which uh, does not uh, need to discussion here, but what we have made. So, we consider the mapping. This is the mapping. And then you, we see that if we take an average over the ensemble of uh, theta, this average of sine equals to zero, and then we end up that i n plus one equals to i n. Obviously, this is average. The average of i is not a good variable. So instead of looking at the average, we look at the squared dynamical variable. So we squ square both sides. We end up with this term squared and the three terms coming from the squared of the right hand side. So the, uh, we don't need this anymore. Then there is an assumption we should, we should make here because there is a cross term here. One that depends only on i, the other one that depends only on theta, but there is a cross term here. If we do an ensemble average here, we should assume for the chaotic C below the uh, periodic regions that I is uncorrelated to theta. If, if we assume this uncorrelation, the average of sine goes to zero, and then we end up with this very simple equation here that may be transformed, so this is a difference, this is an equation of differences. We may transform this equation of differences onto a differential equation. And then we may integrate and we end up with this expression here that gives us, as a bonus, the exponent beta 0 0.5, analytically. So you said, if you ask me, oh, I don't like this approximation, you are transforming uh, equations of differences into a differential equation. My answer is, okay, so uh, you do not need to transform this. Use composition. You may just compose the equations. If you compose the equations, you start with the first interaction, and then with the second, and then the third, and then we end up with the last one, i n plus one. It's exactly the same result we have seen before 
with the difference that we must take the root mean, the, the square root here. So the result is exactly the same. Doesn't matter if we use this transformation or by, by composition. Then came uh, so one of the three exponents was obtained, 0.5, which gives the acceleration ex exponent. Let us come to the second one. The second one is exponent that depends on the position of the first invariant spanning curve. The curve I have uh, shown before, marked by red dots. And then came the connection with the standard map, Shirikov map. So, the Shirikov map is written this way. And what we want to do? Our phase space is plotted here. So we see large chaotic C, invariant spanning curves, either positive or negative, but they are symmetric. There is a shift on the phase, but essentially they are located at the same position. That depends on the parameter epsilon. So what we want to do? We want to describe our mapping locally by using a transition well known in the standard map. What transition? A transition to locally chaotic dynamics above of the curves or down there to a globally chaotic dynamics. This transition is observed at k 0 0.91, 0 0.9716 and so on. Okay, so what we do then? This is our mapping. We have then to rewrite uh, the equation of the action. Assuming that the equation of action is written in terms of a constant plus a small perturbation. Constant gives uh, the, the average value of this first invariant spanning curve and a slightly perturbation. And using this approximation, we can rewrite the first equation by this uh, perturbation. We can rewrite the second equation of our mapping by ex uh, using this uh, terminology of the perturbation, expand, uh, Taylor expand until first order, first order, and then using uh, this uh, k effective, which is essentially uh, the value Shirikov has found, 0, 9, 7, and so on. And then we end up that the localization of the first invariant spanning curve should depend on epsilon to a power of 1 over gamma plus 1. And this gives our second critical exponent, analytically. So, by the Fermi-Ulan model, this gamma equals to 1. If you remember the plot, our numerical value was about 0 0.5. So we have here gamma 1 plus 1 gives 1 over 2. If we choose the family of uh, error preserving map for gamma 2, we end up with the exponent was about 0 30, which is here analytically one third. And then for any gamma, this expression holds and works very nice, very fine. So we have two critical exponents, the acceleration and the saturation. There is one last thing, which is uh, the, the exponent z. How can we obtain this exponent of the crossover? Well, we have already the regime of growth which is described by a square root of uh, n. When this regime of growth matches the saturation, we isolate the nx. And then isolating this, we end up, this is a pack of constants, and then the relevant uh, uh, result is this one, leading to an exponent minus 2 gamma over gamma, gamma plus 1. So, uh, if gamma is 1, we end up with an exponent minus 1, z minus 1. If gamma is 2, remember the 4 thirds I mentioned it before. So, we have 4 on the, on the numerator and 3 on the denominator. So, this is our minus 4 thirds, analytically. Then, for this description, we have the three critical exponents obtained analytically. 
alpha, beta, beta, and z. All of these results were published uh, earlier in physics letters A. So you may ask, all of the curves you have shown were constructed by very small action. What happens if you give a larger initial action? So the answer is that we may observe a break of symmetry in the probability distribution. So if we plot here uh, i root mean square against n, but carefully, if we carefully choose the initial action in the sense that it is larger than zero, far away from uh, zero, but at the same time smaller than the value of the saturation. So we see two different crossovers here. One crossover changing the regime of growth to the regime of saturation. A second crossover is marked when this plateau changes to a regime of growth. When, and then it follows the curve of growth and approach to a regime of saturation. What explains this uh, additional plateau here? The explanation of this is associated to a break of symmetry of this probability distribution function. So on the horizontal axis, we have the action, i root mean square. Here we have, uh, uh, it, it marks where the initial condition was given. There is a mark here where the saturation happens and there is a mark here where the first invariant spanning curve is. So the, the diffusion may happen only inside of this region here. We start with an initial condition before the saturation. It's smaller than the saturation, but at the same time larger than one. Black curve shows a Gaussian distribution, symmetric. It's equivalent, uh, it's equivalent to this plot here. Then, red curve. Red curve is, gives the exact moment where the Gaussian distribution touches the l inferior limit, the lower bound. Green curve, that is, the symmetry was already broken. So as soon as the symmetry is broken, oops, as soon as the symmetry is broken, we have the regime of growth. So this, uh, this regime, uh, the change from the plateau to the regime of growth is marked by the break of symmetry of the distribution, the probability distribution. And then for any larger value of uh, n, this symmetry is already broken and eventually the, the dynamical variable saturates because the right-hand side of the curve also touches the right-hand side. So there is a saturation of the dynamics. Okay, what can we do then with this, this such type of distribution? The last approach is then an attempt to solve the diffusion equation. And here comes nice and at the same time results that may uh, annoy. Why? Because uh, to well, this is a uh, second order differential equation in the i variable and first order in n is a partial differential equation. And we have here the diffusion coefficient, which may be assumed at first uh, order as a constant. So uh, let us then have a glance of the behavior of the diffusion coefficient for f along the chaotic C. We have here four different uh, plots, uh, four different curves obtained for different control parameters. What is this age on the horizontal axis? This age is uh, a mark we add on the phase space measured always with respect to i equals to zero. So is a specific weight that the particle can uh, move and cross. So we see that the diffusion coefficient stays constant for a relatively large range of this age until eventually the particle reaches 
periodic island. So when the particle reaches periodic islands, the diffusion coefficient is no longer constant. It may uh, slightly grow and then uh, decreases later on for even larger value. So here we have uh, uh, chosen specific axis to uh, overlap the curves onto d over epsilon squared in one and this uh, age over epsilon, epsilon is the counter parameter. So what this plot tell us? The plot tell us that along the chaotic sea, far away from the periodic islands, the diffusion coefficient is almost constant. As soon as the particles reach the periodic regions, KM islands, for instance, the diffusion coefficient decreases uh, significantly. So the diffusion is no longer normal. We may have anomalous diffusion. And this uh, uh, typical decrease on the diffusion coefficient is a clear evidence of the stickiness, it's temporary trapping near the periodic islands. Okay, so uh, on the talk of uh, Fishman, we, we have seen this survival probability. This uh, survival probability is basically defined as the probability a particle survives moving in a given region of the phase space before escaping such a region. And this uh, survival probability is constructed against n, which is uh, the discrete time, and uh, very fast decays are signature of chaotic dynamics, uh, of absence of stickiness. This is the uh, proper term. But eventually, this exponential decay may turn into a slower decay that may be power law, but not, not necessarily power law. We may have other slower decays, such as stretched exponentials, as for example, and so on. But the slower decays are uh, typical uh, evidences that the particles are experiencing stickiness or being temporary trapping, trapped. So uh, then we decided to solve this diffusion equation far away from the stickiness regions. So the technique is traditional. We, we may separate the uh, variables. The, the range of capital I is minus I fisk to I fisk minus I fisk shows the lower bound, I FISC shows the upper bound, FISC is the acronym for first invariant spanning curve. This uh, boundary condition is defined as derivative of P, which is the probability with respect to I, evaluated along the invariant spanning curve should be zero. What this uh, gave us? It, it tells us that there is no flu of particles crossing the invariant spanning curves. Of course, it, it should not cross because uh, otherwise the Liouville theorem would be uh, uh, violated. Initial condition is a delta function and this I0 should belong to this interval. Solution is beautiful like this one. Uh, but we don't need to uh, discuss each term here. Once we have the probability, we may obtain I squared with just a direct integration. We uh, end up with this expression. But if you remember our uh, previous result defining I root mean square, there was, uh, it was obtained by two averages, one over N and one over the ensemble of initial conditions. And this result here gave us only along uh, an ensemble of different initial conditions. So uh, to compare the results with the numericals, we have to do an average over the uh, orbit. And this is expression here is gave us the average over the orbit. 
And the most beautiful result is compacted on this uh, plot here. What, what we can see, the symbols gives the simulation. And the continuous curve is exact solution obtained by the diffusion equation. So we have a very good agreement of these uh, two curves. There is a small difference of the curves near the crossover, but overall the curves overlap each other very well. And similar as we have made on the uh, Fermi-Ulan model, all, uh, we, we may choose different initial actions, not necessarily zero, but uh, or very close to zero, and the curves are very well described also by this, uh, by this analytical uh, solution. Uh, we also obtained the, the critical exponents, square root uh, applied to n gives the beta, in uh, nx gives here the exponent z, which is this one, and the saturation it was obtained by the first invariant spanning curve we have already discussed. Evidences of stickiness. So, uh, along the chaotic sea, far away from the KM islands, the diffusion is well described by the solution of the diffusion equation. So, uh, this marks red and blue. Uh, the, the red one, we, we cannot, we, we almost not see uh, periodic regions here, but they do exist. Uh, on the scale of the figure, we cannot see visually, but they, they exist, so there is an exponential decay. And then for very, very little initial conditions, there is some trapping. So, uh, if we compare this result with Altman result yesterday, we have here five, ten, uh, five times 10 to the eight initial condition. And very few initial conditions are trapped, very, very uh, uh, away on the tail. And then, when we move to this blue curve here, we see the presence of the islands, and then the stickiness starts earlier. So uh, many more particles are trapped on the stickiness. So whenever we see stickiness, uh, diffusion equation uh, with this diffusion coefficient constant is no longer satisfied anymore. So what is the solution? I don't know. Okay, so I'm, I'm finishing. Perhaps assuming that this diffusion equation is no longer constant, but a function that may depend on the dynamical variable, perhaps a tensor, I don't know. Uh, and all of these results I have uh, discussed here can be generalized and applied to billiards. So there is a typical example of a billiard, particles moving inside a confined region. This boundary is moving in time. Behavior of the average velocity is very similar to what we have seen here. They uh, overlap it onto each other, onto a single and universal curves. All this dis distribution of velocities are very similar to what we have seen before, guaranteeing convergence to the uh, stationary state. There is a list of collaboration. collaboration. Uh, uh, conclusions. There are two scaling laws for the dissipative mapping, which lead to uh, universal exponents, which do not depend on the nonlinearity or on the dissipation. And for the second part, the exponents do depend on the uh, parameters. And all the results can be generalized to billiards. So thank you very much.